champion today. Thank you for joining us for the Office of the Vice President for Research's 2021 Celebration of Research and Innovation, Day 3's Roundtable on Temple University's Extraordinary Research Response to the Challenge of COVID-19. I'm Kimberly Reinagle, Executive Director in the Office of the Vice President for Research, and I want to go over a few logistical notes before we get started. If you have any technical issues during today's meeting, please contact Temple University ITS support Mitch Delaney at mitchd at temple.edu or Zoom technical support at 1-888-799-9666 and selects op option two. Details on this is also being shared in the webinar chat now. The audio for today's webinar will be streamed through your computer speakers or through the call-in feature, depending on which you selected. Submit your questions you have through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If, you are unable, if we are unable to get to your question during the meeting, it will be posted on OBPR's website. Today's webinar is being recorded. That recording and the meeting slides will be posted on our website after the meeting. I'm now happy to turn things over to Temple University's Vice President for Research, Michelle Masucci. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Welcome to the final day of Temple University's 2021 Celebration of Research and Innovation. Uh, we appreciate your patience as we get started this, more, this afternoon. Um, we are working on bringing Dr. Jody Black in from the Food and Drug Administration. So our program change will be that we begin with our panel discussion and then we will turn our attention to Dr. Black towards the end of the presentation. We're very pleased to have had over 450 participations during these past three days. Um, and I wanna take a moment to recognize uh, our company spinoffs and our partners who have been in attendance since a very big part of what we do in OVPR is to really work on the innovation component of our program. So I wanna recognize Express Cells, New S, MAP Ventures, Upright VR, HGE Health, Polyceramics, Preventix, Stereotherapeutics, and Excision bio, uh, Biotherapeutics for their participation, both on, as panelists as well as uh, during the program. In addition, I want to note um, that we've been very pleased to have the Science Center, Biostrategy Partners, Mid-Atlantic Diamond Ventures, and QED Award winners um, and honorees with us as well. I also wanna thank the organizers of this event, Julie Stapleton Carroll, Lou Bicelli, Todd Abrams, and Kim Reinigal. They have done a fantastic job of getting us organized. Um, today, we honor the incredible work being done by Temple Healthcare providers and researchers to address the COVID-19 crisis in Philadelphia and beyond. They have worked tirelessly to both respond to the healthcare needs associated with the crisis and to provide continuity in the educational experiences our students have been so that have uh, disrupted our student experiences. I'd really like to give you a window into the magnitude of Temple's research response. I mentioned in my comments on Tuesday that we have attracted more than $32 million in COVID related funding to the university and that we have an additional 32 million in pending dollars. We also worked right. to identify COVID-19 as a theme for investment by the Office of the VP for Research through our catalytic research funding program and we hope to consolidate some of our efforts through that funding. We worked with the Commonwealth of PA through the PA Cure program to prioritize COVID-19 as the thematic thrust of non-formula funding that research universities in PA may compete for this year. And we now have pending funding under consideration with that program. Closer to home, um, as I have mentioned before, our institutional review board has put this in perspective by noting that for the past year, we have reviewed on average one COVID protocol every three days with over 135 protocols uh, that have been submitted through this crisis. Temple has also relied on collaborations across the university to design and develop solutions for personal protective equipment, to implement COVID testing programs, to make space available for testing and vaccinations, and to meet the needs of both our university and surrounding community at each challenge presented. 
as I mentioned before, um, we will be welcoming Dr. Black at the end of the program since we have been dealing with some technical difficulties. But what I also wanted to do was to introduce our panelists so that we could begin a conversation about some of this amazing work that's been done at Temple University. I'm gonna start by introducing Dr. Sergey Pond, who is a professor in the Department of Biology and a core member of the Institute for Genomics and Evolutionary Medicine, iGEM at Temple University. So Sergey, I'm gonna have you get us started and then when you're done, you can turn the floor to uh, Sergio Ramirez. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. If we could advance to the first slide, please. I'll give you a very brief um, overview of um, my research group. Uh, I'm um, the principal investigator of an interdisciplinary computational group, computational biology group uh, at Temple Institute of Genomic, for Genomics and Evolutionary Medicine. Uh, our group focuses on uh, statistical methodology and tool development uh, for genomic analyses. You know, prior to um, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, we had close to two, two decades experience doing translational research on other uh, RNA viruses of significant public concern, HIV-1, influenza, hepatitis C. But um, since March 2020, we've been heavily focused on SARS-CoV-2, which is the causative agent of COVID-19. Uh, through this work, uh, we've gained international reputation and recognition for state-of-the-art techniques and software, specifically for studying selective pressures and viruses and other organisms. And that's what led to um, you know, the focus of our research uh, on SARS-CoV-2 in 2020 and beyond. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, SARS-CoV-2 um, is uh, an RNA virus. Uh, RNA viruses as uh, a, a a family of organisms evolve very rapidly. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, for example, is expected to generate uh, about eight changes per 10,000 nucleotides per year, which means over the course of a year, um, we expect there to be about 24 nucleotide differences uh, between two viral genomes accumulating. This rate is about 100,000 times faster compared to humans, but about 10 times slower compared to other RNA viruses that you might have heard of. Uh, like influence, HIV, and hepatitis C. A remarkable aspect of um, the scientific response worldwide to this pandemic uh, was uh, a, a, an international effort to generate a vast quantity of viral genomes. Uh, in a year, uh, we have generated as a community over a million viral sequences. It is truly unprecedented. Nothing like this has ever happened before, come even close. Uh, with uh, such a depth uh, of genomic databases, we can expect to see a mutation in every position of the genome. Um, many of those are errors, and many of those you will see highlighted uh, uh, in popular press whenever a new mutation comes up. It's always a question of, is it gonna make the, the virus worse? Uh, so most mutations in the viral genomes uh, are neutral, so which means they aren't gonna do very much, but some are very consequential. And some of the things that we've been trying to focus on is trying to understand which ones are consequential and can we predict them and can we do something about them? Next slide, please. I'd like to highlight a couple of um, uh, studies that my group have been involved in that have all been recently published. One of the um, areas uh, of great interest is uh, the uh, evolution of viruses in animals, transmission, from animals to humans and early evolution in humans. Um, so one of the uh, studies that uh, was recently published in, with international collaboration that our group was involved with uh, determined that natural selection of SARS-CoV-2 in bats created uh, a virus highly capable of uh, um, uh, transmission in humans. Next slide, please. Uh, in collaboration uh, with Dr. Kumar's lab, uh, who is the director of uh, our iGEM Institute here at Temple, we applied uh, methods um, developed for cancer genomics to try to characterize the evolutionary history, the sequence of accumulated mutations in the virus as it was evolving through its um, unobserved progenitor strain, which occurred sometime in October of 2019, as it spread through the, uh, through, through the world and through time. So you can think of this as basically evolutionary and genomic fingerprinting of different viral strains that, is, uh, that helps us understand its history, uh, spread, and dynamics. Next slide, please. Uh, we've developed a large number of uh, tools. There's just a screenshot uh, uh, from one of our uh, online tools that allows you to track 
uh, you know, geographic and temporal spread of particular mutations. This is something that everybody has heard of, the N501Y mutation, a key mutation has recently emerged uh, in the UK, South African and Brazilian lineages, and is now sort of the dominant, uh, uh, it's present in the dominant strains. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, our most recent work, we're trying to understand, um, you know, what's going to the, vi what, what, where is the virus going? So there is some evidence uh, that there are multiple viral lineages circulating in different countries that are all sort of converging uh, on, onto the same core set of mutations, which might be associated with the fact that we as humans are now developing an immune response to the virus. So we're trying to understand, uh, you know, whether or not we, we can predict what's going to happen in the future, if we can anticipate a little bit of um, viral evolution, perhaps better uh, uh, be better prepared to respond to it. Uh, so this is all I have uh, as a matter of my introduction, and I'm happy to hand it off to my colleague, Dr. Servia Ramirez. Great. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, uh, Kimberly, if that's OK. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Great, thank you. Uh, and thank you so much, Sergey, for uh, introducing me. Um, my name is Sergio Ramirez. I'm in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine here at the um, Lewis Katz School of Medicine, Temple University. And um, I, I certainly first want to start off by thanking Dr. Masucci and, and the organizers, Julie Carroll, Kimberly, uh, Brian Agle, Todd Abrams for inviting me to this uh, roundtable discussion. My um, and my hope is to sort of, you know, give you a, an idea of some of the work that uh, we've been heavily involved since the uh, uh, since the pandemic uh, broke out. So, if I may, let's let's just go back essentially a year a year ago. Uh, it was around this time last year when the WHO declared that. COVID-19 had reached the status of global pandemic. Um, the symptoms of COVID-19 were becoming well recognized, right? Fever, cough, difficulty breathing. But then at that time, we're, there were also stories that were starting to, to come out about un unusual symptoms related to headaches and confusion, seizures, tingling and numbness, loss of smell and taste. Um, there was also a concern that survivors of COVID-19 might be at increased risk of neurological disorders. So, and, and this concern initially was based on findings from other coronaviruses. Um, so, uh, SARS-CoV-1, SARS uh, MERS, uh, we knew that um, there were some neurological presentations with, uh, with those infections as well. So, uh, so some, it was somewhat not surprising to, to hear that this novel pathogen could have an effect on, on the central nervous system. Um, so, it, it's it, right away, and, and of course now we, we understand, or at least we, uh, um, well, the variants are kind of throwing a, a bit of a, uh, a monkey wrench in, in, into the statistics, but roughly about 36 to 40% of patients show signs of nervous system related issues uh, after um, uh, infection. And um, in, in the presentation of abnormal brain images, um, there's reports uh, uh, coming from all over the world about uh, what, um, essentially neural COVID-19 uh, may look like. Um, more recently, there, have been, there has been some efforts in understanding the neuroinvasiveness of this pathogen. Uh, and, I, and I will touch up on that. The, uh, the SARS has really become, SARS-CoV-2, and, and in some ways you could argue it's becoming a, a vascular uh, disease. And so, it was very interesting to, to start to, from a scientist standpoint, to, to think about this cold virus causing uh, so many issues in terms of the vasculature. And, and, and of course, the, immediately the, the, the questions that we had from, uh, from the standpoint of neuroscience, and it was, um, if this is affecting perif the peripheral vasculature, could this be also affecting uh, the brain's vasculature? So, um, at the time, we, we really had very little information uh, related to these questions. And so as, as our lab was <laughs> starting to shut down and, and essentially you know, sending people home, um, there was this anxiety from, from us in, well, how can we help? How can we contribute to understand, to the understanding of what this pathogen may be doing? Uh, and so the opportunity to, to study um, 
uh, the pathogenesis of this virus in the brain uh, was really what we, we uh, held on to and, and, and went to work. Um, so um, it was briefly mentioned how what SARS is and what it looks like. I think most of us have, most of us have seen uh, to death some of these pictures of the coronavirus. Um, and for the purpose of this, the next two or three slides, I just want you to think about the spike protein that it's out, uh, um, that protrudes outside the, the virus. Um, and this is the, the spike protein is what thought is what is thought to to affect the the vasculature um, in in a, in a negative way, um, and even blood components. So the the main thing that we focused on was the binding. Um, uh, the, the binding target of the virus, which is ACE2. And so um, at this point, we, uh, we started looking at the expression of this target protein on cells that the virus binds to. Um, what uh, is ACE2 uh, present in brain tissue? Um, is it affected by comorbidity? So if you have a history of hypertension, it, could we see the expression of this um, uh, target um, enhanced. Uh, we published a paper last summer, um, it's a preprint, and then later we published in neurobiology, neurobiology of Disease on these findings. Um, I do want to acknowledge the NIH director for putting focus on our study, and um, I'm very, uh, we're very grateful for that. Um, and so just to sort of very, very quickly just go over these this key findings. Um, the, the brain does express this target protein in the brain vasculature. Um, what we're looking at here is in blue. These are capillaries. This is postmortem. So this is tissue um, uh, uh, brain sections um, that uh, looking at the expression of ACE2. So that, that light blue, it's, it's what we're you know, sort of focusing on. Um, now, in cases or in, in patients who had a history of hypertension, the ACE2 protein is just incredibly upregulated. So those same vessels or those very similar caliber vessels, we can see how uh, the, the, the intensity of that blue pattern is greatly uh, augmented. Um, and we looked at some, some brains uh, from people who, who had uh, dementia and the same story, we had this enhanced expression. So, um, so the, the target is there for the virus to bind to. Essentially, that's what this slide shows. Um, so, but what does that really mean? And um, what, what we were able to do, and, and this is something that um, I will talk a little bit more about uh, in the next slide, is the ability to create these constructs that allows us to essentially recreate a, a small piece of the brain. Um, and if, if we have this vessel-like structure, that we can then introduce uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Um, what we were able to, to determine was that the vessels can become leakier if the spike protein is present in the bloodstream. And so if this tracer is confined to the vasculature under normal situations or normal conditions, this is what the spike protein may do to that vessel. And you can see that, that tracer leaking out of this, um, this construct or this vessel. Uh, uh, structure. So uh, this really sort of pointed to the notion that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein can engage the endothelium, and especially in the brain where you, you don't want leaky vessels anywhere, but especially in the brain where the networks that are behind those vascular elements uh, need to be very, very, the environment needs to be very tightly regulated. So leaky vessels is going to disrupt the, um, those neuronal networks. Um, so we were able to provide answers to some of those questions that the ACE2 is expressed in the brain uh, vasculature that in, in comorbidities that are known to worsen COVID-19 outcomes that uh, the ACE2 is upregulated uh, and that the spike protein of this virus can affect the permeability status of the vasculature. Um, so I, I, the outlook for us now is that we, we really have created a platform, if you will, that allows us to test um, going into the future, what this virus may do to, again, that small block of, of human brain tissue that we've recreated in the lab, um, not only to understand the potential neuroinvasiveness, but also to understand the, uh, the possibility of countermeasures to prevent the virus from potentially crossing into the central nervous system. Um, and with that, I, I 
I'm happy to um, to take some questions later. Uh, very quickly, though, I do want to acknowledge the lab. It takes it takes a lot of people with very uh, specialized uh, skills to make this work happen. And the, and the work that I presented was mostly due from uh, our postdoctoral fellow, uh, Dr. Buzdigan. Um, so with that, I will I will yield the floor back to Kimberly. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Gerhard, Dr. Glenn Gerhard, and um, um, please, Glenn, uh, take it away. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Sergio. Um, my uh, my uh, uh, sort of introduction to uh, uh, COVID and, and the pandemic uh, was back in first slide, um, and as Sergio mentioned, and um, back in a year ago, March, when it first came out. So on the left is a, a, an email I got about the Thermo Fisher. Um, uh, got an FDA emergency use authorization for their um, uh, real-time PCR test for COVID-19 RNA. And that's when uh, my lab, uh, which had not been doing any sort of um, work on, on the viruses at all, but decided to implement uh, uh, some diagnostic testing because we have a what's called a CLIA um, a certificate. So we're, we're, we're enabled to do some uh, clinical testing. So we we then embarked on a long odyssey, um, mainly driven by supply chain issues uh, to develop a, an assay, which we did. And then the second uh, major um, event was uh, on the right showing a Wall Street Journal article, I believe in October, um, that uh, profiled the Broad Institute's um, testing for colleges in New England and uh, Temple University's leadership uh, wondered if uh, Temple could do the, that something like that for Temple University going into the spring semester. Um, so we embarked on that and, and that was really, I uh, worked very closely and that was really led by uh, two people, the late John uh, Dean Daly. Um, he, uh, he, he and I uh, sort of um, uh, really worked closely to, to get the, the general um, concept of the lab going. Um, and also uh, Mark Denis in um, Employee Student Health. Mark and, and I have, have, have partnered. And I really, Mark has been sort of the leader of, of getting the whole program uh, going. Um, we just, uh, he gets us the samples and then we, we uh, do the, the, the testing. Um, next slide. Uh, and as Servio just showed that, I was showing the same thing. It's an RNA virus. And so we're, we are detecting RNA, but first we turn it into DNA and then we do uh, PCR. Um, and we're also now doing um, some limited sequencing to define uh, types that, that Sergey mentioned, um, especially the UK variant, uh, which is now um, uh, really rising uh, in terms of uh, percentage of, of cases. And then uh, last slide I'll show you just, we went from an empty lab and this is a movie actually, uh, Kimberly, I don't know if you can, there you go. So here's coming into the lab, sorry, it's a little bit, you get, we went with robotics, these little modular robots that, that were actually sort of low cost um, and, and you could daisy chain them together. We need uh, hoods. We have to divide the rooms up into sample processing. This is the RNA room and actually the RNA room is split up uh, into two areas. And then we use robots to prepare for the PCR machines and um, uh, that, that actually run, can run 384 samples at a time and we have two machines. And you can see on my, uh, on my slide background, those colored lines that are going up, those are actually positive uh, fluorescence from positive cases, whereas that sort of horizontal flat line down the bottom by the numbers, those are negative, all the negative cases. And so that's what we've been doing now. Uh, we've passed over 90,000 um, uh, uh, of the sessions uh, that we've uh, tested um, uh, as of, uh, I think, last week. And uh, so mainly it's been sort of clinical and surveillance, but we've also uh, done some, um, some support for a couple of clinical projects, uh, one of which, uh, a couple of which have been uh, with Nina and Gentile, who I will um, uh, pass the baton off to next. Um, hi there, thank you so much, Glenn, for um, your introduction. Um, I'm Nina Gentile, I'm a professor of emergency medicine, um, have been working uh, primarily as a clinician in the emergency department, um, but also um, have a role in um, as the lead um, researcher in our department um, uh, that has had um, 
uh, the fortune to have um, uh, and opportunities to participate in, um, uh, in a number of areas of research, um, uh, most recently in infectious disease, sepsis, and in, uh, and in this case uh, became involved with, um, with this epidemic, uh, in part because that was, um, a, uh, we were able to um, conduct clinical research in that area. Um, and we thought that it was critical. Um, and uh, I'll tell you some of the, the studies that we participated in that we thought were critical in terms of the impact that it made to our, um, uh, our patients um, and frankly, our staff as well. So if you go on to the first slide, um, these are, um, uh, I, I, I just wanna back up just a smidge um, and talk about the, um, the research, the response. Um, is really a um, is a uh, an institutional response, uh, particularly in our um, as it was felt in our emergency departments and throughout the hospital. Um, the the COVID response in the emergency department was extensive. It, it involves changes to not only our workforce, our staff, but also huge changes that impact the, our patients um, and the entire community. Um, when we were first notified of our uh, of the the presence of this virus and what um, uh, and what the um, what some of the um, cases may look like. We were literally learning um, about it as we um, sort of on the job. We were we had already been seeing many of these patients. Um, we were learning the signs and symptoms of the disease, um, and it really and it required a, a shift in the way that we approached um, our patients, which is. Um, uh, a remarkable thing to need to, to do when it's as um, uh, as uh, um, when the volume um, is so um, is so high in that condition, um, we we had to relearn how to approach um, individuals um, who are coming to us with you know symptoms of a sore throat that would be that would normally have been um, uh, could would have been benign. Um, General fatigue or cough could be could turn out to be COVID. Um, uh, having to appreciate that the cor the course of this disease was so unlike any other, um, it really uh, it was a big change in our medical decision making in our culture. Um, that we um, we had to appreciate that someone who was just a little bit sick or had been sick for a number of days could all of a sudden become. Um, acutely ill um, and deteriorate before, and sometimes before our very eyes. It, it could happen so quickly. Um, these are the, those types of um, just understanding the disease itself uh, really forced a, a change in the way that we practiced and the, um, the way that we, you know, it's sort of in, in our decision making. So in, in, the, in short, what we needed to do was we needed to, we were told we need to be careful because it really could be anywhere. Um, and, and it was really anywhere could, um, uh, that um, you know, someone here that we thought um, uh, we had a good handle on could turn out to be, could turn out to be COVID. Uh, we were instructed to be careful um, we were given, um, and uh, with uh, huge donations, I know Michelle mis mentioned some of the donations of PPE that we had received, and that's our first picture here. This is a, a donation of, of uh, N95s that we received. Um, we, um, uh, we were told um, that they were scarce, that we needed to develop algorithms for how to use our PPE. Um, that um, we were told um, we needed to um, uh, be judicious about using um, about um, uh, how to um, uh, how to um, approach people, um, just how the degree of contact that we have with individuals. Our medics were coming to us, telling us that we they were being discouraged from doing resuscitation in the field. Um, they. Um, from intubating patients, from doing even CPR when um, uh, without uh, without knowing what they were dealing with, some of the staff uh, were were frankly afraid to go home. Um, there were people that didn't go home for weeks at a time. The um, 
uh, they, they were told, um, uh, as far as our patients, um, their patients were told to stay home, as you all know. Uh, we were all told um, stay home. And for a lot of people, that meant stay away from the emergency department as well. Um, those who did come, um, we were evaluating them in this um, on the, the middle panel here. This is our standalone tent that we were using. Um, it's, uh, it's actually in front of the emergency department. It's in the next to the parking lot between the parking lot and the emergency department. We were screening patients who were um, uh, who were uh, had minor conditions um, to see whether they needed to come, uh, whether they should take the risk of coming into the emergency department to be evaluated. Um, is sort of the perspective that they were um, that, that we were using and that um, have, uh, are starting to use again with each of the surgeons as it comes up. Um, unfortunately, what that meant was a lot of our patients were um, were afraid to come, and we had um, there was uh, uh, we were able to report even our, with our own data um, a twenty five to thirty percent drop in the number of patients with stroke and with acute and acute MI uh, that were coming to our emergency departments. That um, uh, is likely to be uh, not that they weren't having stroke or acute MI, but rather they weren't coming, you know, they weren't coming uh, um, early enough. Um, the, uh, um, as uh, at the, the last photo here is, um, is, it shows a structural change um, what we tried to do was make our emergency department uh, separate out the um, potential COVID versus non-COVID. So what you'll see is an area that's been um, restructured so that it's a lot more, um, uh, there's uh, more isolation rooms and um, there's, uh, um, and uh, to protect our staff and to protect, and to protect our, our, our families. Um, Families weren't able to come into the emergency department unless they had, um, unless there was a dire need. Um, and often, uh, I think probably one of our uh, most um, tragic um, experiences that many of us had was to um, you know, be taking care of someone who um, was dying um, in, the, in an emergency department where they, nothing is familiar to them without family. Um, the uh, the other thing the other person that you're seeing at the the tail end of at the bottom of that screen is uh, someone with PPE that we were wearing pretty much day in and day out. Um, can you go to the next slide? So um, we uh, I will I will say even with all of the um, the changes that we put into place and the protection that we um, that we. Uh, instructed our staff to use uh, what this slide shows as a uh, some local data of um, and the antibody response um, the uh, in among our frontline workers um, who have since now been called the super spreaders um, and the reason for that is because uh, while um, they are uh, using their, their PPE and um, uh, doing everything they uh, they can um, are being told um, uh, that particularly as a frontline worker you are at the highest risk. Um, about twenty percent of our frontline workers uh, had antibodies to um, uh, SARS CoV one CoV two um, in uh, when they were tested in May in uh, April and May of last year. Um, when um, just as a follow up that's not shown here. Um, is that when they were um, tested again three months later, many, much of those antibodies were, um, had disappeared. Um, so um, kind of speaking to the need for additional protection and vaccination. Um, the other, uh, 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 what we, the other forms of protection that, um, uh, that we um, implemented, we tried to, um, that we were considering, was other forms of, of, um, of uh, protection in, in the form of chemo prophylaxis. Um, we participated in a trial of a national trial of a, um, uh, of a hydroxychloroquine in an effort to prevent um, uh, COVID in um, high risk healthcare workers um, that um, ultimately proved uh, not to be effective, but um, was certainly, um, uh, uh, there was quite a bit of interest um, with most of us um, 
uh, realized that um, there, uh, there needed to be um, measures beyond um, physical barriers uh, to try and stave off this disease. Um, we did, we implemented um, and facilitated testing, um, antibody testing we talked about, and also some rapid um, nasal swab testing. Um, very strict quarantine requirements um, uh, and restrictions for anyone who was either um, had, a, uh, had a, a significant exposure um, or certainly turned positive. Can you go on to the next slide? Um, the other um, research um, that we um, took on uh, was um, looked at some early treatment to prevent the worsening of COVID-19. Um, uh, some of this was funded um, by NIH. We did a convalescent plasma, a trial of convalescent plasma in um, early COVID uh, in patients with uh, milder disease um, uh, with, uh, with the hope that they would not um, worsen and um, uh, end up needing hospitalization. Um, we are um, in, we, uh, we are planning to participate in um, other um, repurpose drugs um, for the, that same early treatment using some um, what were considered antivirals um, in the effort to, um, uh, again, um, uh, treat early disease um, when uh, before the virus has really taken hold. Uh, go on to the next slide. Um, probably the most um, uh, the largest effort that we've made um, has been in, um, we participated or have been participating in a phase three vaccine trial. Um, the, uh, this slide shows the, um, the background for, um, for the phase three trial. This is the um, results of the phase one, phase two A trial that showed that even with, um, uh, that with low dose, um, uh, as well as with high dose, but with a um, uh, low dose, um, single um, dose vaccine of um, uh, was able to mount a, an immune response at day 29 that was um, substantial and rose um, slightly at day 57 um, and, um, and slightly more at day 71. So with that background, um, there, uh, the, go on to the next slide. Um, J and J designed the phase three trial to demonstrate to look at the efficacy of this vaccine to prevent disease um, at um, and looked at day fourteen and at day twenty eight as their endpoints. So the next slide. Um, the um, uh, the trial has completed enrollment. Um, completed it December seventeenth. There were forty four thousand. Uh, people randomized throughout the world in eight countries. Um, the U.S. Um, uh, uh, contributed the majority of the of the enrollments. Um, Temple um, uh, participated throughout the of uh, the enrollment period. Um, we had uh, by virtue of our um, uh, of our location, we had a highly diverse um, study population. 38% of our participants were non-white. Um, and uh, one of the area, one of the um, uh, populations that they really wanted to target was um, the older uh, population, those aged greater than 60. And um, we um, helped to contribute to that population as well. The next slide. Um, the, this is um, the, uh, the slide. Um, the results that were um, presented to the FDA in uh, February um, uh, in its request, um, in j and js request for emergency use authorization. Um, what this shows is a, um, a summary of the uh, cases of, um, uh, of uh, COVID um, in the active versus the placebo arm. Uh, and what you'll see, I don't have the control of the pointer, but what you can see is that um, the, the lines start to separate at day 14, um, and that by day 28, which was the endpoint of, of interest, uh, there was a 66% difference between active and placebo treatment arms in, um, uh, in confirmed cases of COVID. 
Um, it does, the line does seem to separate further thereafter, but those data have not been analyzed and haven't been reported as such. What we do know is that by day 46, um, there was um, a higher um, uh, efficacy um, and what was reported was it was 85% of, um, uh, effective at that point. Um, in the U, so this is globally in the US, there's a 72% um, uh, difference between active and placebo um, and uh, um, an 85% difference in um, severe um, cases or those requiring hospitalizations. On to the next slide. I think the last thing I wanted to leave you with was um, just sort of a difference between the comparing the vaccines that I'm sure everyone has heard um, an awful lot about. There's been, uh, uh, people have become so much more scientifically astute uh, through this pandemic than ever I've ever heard. Uh, so we know that the two mRNA vaccines, the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine are both um, two doses. Uh, they both require um, some pretty um, deep freeze. Um, and yet our um, reported um, efficacy is very, very high, uh, boards of 94, 95%. A recent um, study showed a, a report um, of, uh, at six, that at six months, the immune response is still substantial um, in, those, uh, in, uh, in the, at least the Moderna vaccine. The J&J &J vaccine and AstraZeneca are similar in that they are both adenoviral vector vaccines uh, the one difference between those two is that um, after that single dose um, of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, there is um, a similar um, degree of efficacy as the um, two-dose vaccine for the, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, the, um, what this translates to is um, a, a difference in terms of um, access to them, um, which I think um, uh, people have talked quite a bit about um, from a, in terms of its impact, um, not only to our community here, uh, which I think is, um, is substantial, but also to the world. So I'll, I'll stop there. I'm sure there's uh, plenty of questions. There are some, um, uh, this has been, um, th there have been a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of discussion, especially recently about the J&J &J vaccine. Um, so I'm sure there, there are questions about that and be happy to talk about that when uh, during the Q&A. Um, but I will stop here. Um, Dr. Kreiner is, uh, will be speaking next, Dr. Gerard Kreiner, and I'll let him introduce himself. Thanks, Nita. Thanks, Michelle, for asking me to talk for a few minutes. If you can go to my first slide, and I don't have to. <clears throat> I'm just going to give you a quick snapshot of what um, Temple has done in terms of um, addressing the pandemic, both clinically and research-wise. This is um, this is a snapshot of the total effort that we've done up through, I guess, 405 days ago. This is the 405th day in managing hospitalized COVID patients uh, in the hospital and in the intensive care unit. And as you can see in the top right of this graph, we have treated over 11,000 patients at Temple with who are COVID positive. About 7,000 of those have been admitted to the hospital and about 4,000 of those are outpatients. And as you can see, our discharge mortality at the bottom of this is 4.4%, which is unacceptably high. But when you compare it to what others have experienced with treating this patient population, it's extraordinarily better than what others have reported. Our overall 30-day mortality is about 32% and 33% lower than statewide and national Medicare database for patients treated at Temple compared to other centers. So we've done extraordinarily well in taking care of our patients, especially in light that a predominant number of our patients, and I'll show you on the subsequent slide, are at high risk because of ethnic uh, uh, background or their gender or their race. Um, and we think that this is due to really a combined effort of a multidisciplinary approach and a comprehensive planning as well as treatment paradigm that uh, was devoted to the planning and care of patients during a COVID-19 infection. As Nina mentioned, and I think other speakers before that, that the science is evolving and continues to evolve in, in terms of the pathogenesis, the prevention and the treatment of this um, pathogen. 
and we credit clinical research as being an important instrument throughout this. To date, we've enrolled patients in over 33 prospective randomized multi-center trials and close to 700 patients now, about half of them being female, and about 50 to 60% of them being minority, which I think really strikes the, the service that Temple provides to the community at large. Um, we have 17 other uh, research projects that are in the process of being implemented. We currently have seven uh, studies that are um, submitted to the NIH, six of them to the NIH. One of them is to the state of Pennsylvania. And we've also done this in a multidisciplinary fashion with uh, some people in this program, Dr. Gerhard's group, as well as people from the College of Public Health, Dr. Zomba, Dr. Wu, um, has also uh, participated with us looking at vaccine hesitancy and looking at the use of digital health with real world, world data from the electronic medical record, as well as looking at the neurobiology of the disease with autopsy data from, um, from patients who have expired from the disease. And to just a testament to um, how this science is evolving, we're now focused on post-COVID recovery sequela, for which afflicts approximately 60% of patients up to 90 days at least, and some people um, longer than that. We currently see it in clinic, about 25 patients per day that suffer from post-COVID symptoms. We've done six lung transplants so far, patients with persistent and progressive fibrotic disease, and we have a large NI each grant that's uh, to look at the uh, recovery of patients with COVID disease, looking at things that um, for deep phenotyping that predisposes them to um, have those symptoms compared to others that don't. As a result of Temple's involvement, we have uh, been involved in getting approximately six therapies that are now considered standard of care for COVID disease. Temple participated and led several of these studies, including the use of remdesivir, uh, cocktails, monoclonal antibody cocktails with Regeneron and with Lilly, uh, the use of tocilizumab, which is approved in the UK and considered in some centers to be standard. We do it at Temple based on a prospective randomized control trial that we did. It's published in a New England Journal a couple months ago. And also use of systemic steroids, which we were one of the first to use based on discussions with our colleagues from, uh, from Southeast Asia. And now that's considered uh, standard of care. Um, and baricitinib, which also is now uh, EUA approved for the, the treatment of patients with COVID. Um, so Temple's been uh, really a leader and really clinical research has been married uh, from the beginning of the pandemic. And I just wanna say how uh, you know, the Office of Research usually gets complaints, less compliments, but they worked with us to get approvals uh, over the weekend. I remember Easter Passover last year where we had uh, contracting work done uh, by the university, by Dan Starr, Dan Carr, uh, and the IRB to get rapid approval of COVID therapies when we were starting the Rindisavir study. So all members of Temple, both the medical community as well as the university really stepped up and helped us to make an important dent in our patients. Next slide. And this is just a slide of what this means to patients when you can work rapidly, work together, and, work rapidly, and what science can bring to patient care. And you can see Temple's the first, your hospital data that's there, looking at length of stay, ICU care, and then breakdown by demographics. And you can see that our um, involvement with patients who are African American and Hispanic is 100% or more greater than other comparative. Uh, areas in the state and in the nation. And the, the, the misnomer that these patients don't want to participate in clinical research or get the care that's provided to others is a, is a mischaracterization. Patients of minority want to participate in research. Temple does an outstanding job of involving them in research. And I think that's one of the reasons why they have much better outcomes taken care of by at our center than others. So thanks for allowing me to, uh, to present and I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. I really appreciate the shout out as well. The team worked very hard, but you know, there, there is support to everybody else's, you know, amazing work. Um, I, uh, I wanna take the liberty of adjusting a little bit um, how we're gonna proceed. We have a minute or two for a question. 
And I wanna make sure that we do get to Jody Black's presentation. We're at the one o'clock hour. And um, I believe that she can hear us and we can hear her. She's on by telephone. Is that correct, Jody? And you're muted at this moment. We're doing our best to work out our, our, um, our technical difficulties. So let us figure that out. Um, I'm also going to introduce um, David Sauer, who is the Associate Dean for Research and Director of the Center of Obesity Research um, and Education in the College of Public Health. He, he is also the professor. Uh, he's also a professor in the Department of Social and I Behavior. And my watch wants to talk to me too at the same time. Um, he's also a professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. We've, in, we've enlisted him to help us facilitate a dialogue um, about this. And I see now that Jody is off of mute. Is that correct, Jody? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. I'm off of mute, but I can go back on. No, no, we want you, we want you to stay um, available to get started. I'm going to give David the opportunity to curate a couple of questions. And then we will um, do our best to coordinate your presentation. We have slides from Dr. Black and uh, we'll be able to have her, I think, talk through her comments and, and share the slides. Do you think that will work, Dr. Black? David, I'll let you start with questions and we'll work on our coordination. Thank well, you. I'm going to thank you very much, Michelle, for the uh, introduction, the opportunity to moderate this. I'm going to start before I jump into one question, because I think we probably only will have time for one. I just want to um, just tell all of you who presented just now how um, incredibly impressive the clinical and research work that you have done over the past year has been. Um, I've had the fortune of talking, having a couple of conversations with Glenn over the last couple of months, and here's some of the backstory of how his lab came to be. I've had conversations with some of you where you've shared some of the stories of the challenges of, of dealing with COVID-19. And on behalf of the College of Public Health, but I think the entire Temple community, I just wanna say a hearty thank you for everything that you've done. You know, I imagine we could have a session, you know, some point in the fall or a year from now, or we could let you guys just talk for a day and tell us stories of everything that you went through and all the twists and turns of the plot. But it is just so incredibly impressive, not only the care that you've delivered, but also how you've risen to the occasion in terms of the research productivity. And it makes me very proud to play a very small part in today's session, but also that larger uh, work that's been done. So on behalf of all of us, thank you very much. Um, my question is, is a clinical one um, that's been posted. Um, and, and hopefully we can wrap this up quickly and then move on to some after Dr. Black's presentations. Um, given the question is really regarding ACE receptors, and given that ACE receptors were identified as the entry point for the virus, and that the acute inflammatory response was the cause of pulmonary distress, why is it that we think that ACE inhibitors and steroids were largely ineffective in controlling the onset of pneumonia disease? And have these or any other repurposed drugs? been proven to be therapeutic within the last year? I can take that on if you want, uh, David. That, that'd be great. We have a retrospective NIH study. What we were using ACE receptor inhibitors for uh, preventing COPD exacerbations that looked at COVID infections as a result of that. There was about um, 1,000 patients enrolled in that trial. We found no clinical benefit. One of the things that when you see patients present with COVID, when they have, they present symptomatic, it's beyond binding to the receptor. It's well down the line. These patients are informed for us cytokine storm. And, you know, at that point, the receptor has already been uh, attached to and the cascade has been initiated. So I think a lot of it is basically, it may have a preventative role in some cases, but probably not potent enough and not important enough to abrogate the cytokine injury that occurs once the patient presents. Great. Well, M Michelle, we do have a few other questions in the queue, but I suspect that we want to tee things up for Dr. Black. So let me hand things back over to you. Thank you. Um, and we will bring back questions at the end of her presentation as well. 
Um, as we focus today's uh, research on this COVID um, problem and as well on um, the various research activities that have been going on this year, uh, with a very he heavy emphasis on innovation and commercialization, we invited Dr. Jody Black to share comments about sparking innovation from her perspective as the newly appointed Director of the Food and Drug Administration of the uh, Office of Clinical Policy and Programs. In her role, she leads efforts to develop cross-cutting clinical policies and programs to help make effective, safe, and innovative medical products available to the American people. This includes related uh, efforts related to combination products, orphan products, and rare pediatric diseases, addressing ethical issues of clinical research in pediatric populations, overseeing good clinical practice, and protecting people participating in clinical trials. Dr. Black also works collaboratively across FDA to enhance patient engagement and facilitate collaboration between patient advocates and the FDA. She joined the FDA with over 20 years of scientific research and leadership experience with a diverse background in basic and clinical science, as well as program administration. Previously, she served as the deputy director of the Office of Extramural Research, Office of the Director at the National Institutes for Health which leads the corporate framework for NIH Research Administration. She developed, implemented, and managed large, diverse, multidisciplinary scientific programs in areas including infectious diseases, cancer, and genomics. She oversaw peer review processes, policy development and implementation, as well as grant and contract management. And she also formed strategic alliances among academic healthcare and commercialization, uh, commercial organizations to enhance translation of innovative market technologies. She led the efforts to coordinate and enhance small business and entrepreneurial programs and established the Small Business Education and Entrepreneurial Development Office at NIH. She was recently recognized by the Small Business Administration with a 2020 Tibbetts Award for her accomplishments in creating cutting edge technologies through SBA's small business innovation research and small business technology transfer programs. She has led efforts to enhance rapid translation of promising technologies, promoting the roles of women in science and small business and reducing administrative burden among extramural constituents. She's also worked with other federal agencies to lead the US government's international efforts to counter threats to research integrity and the research environment. Dr. Black earned her PhD in experimental pathology and master of medical science in clinical microbiology at Emory University. Please join me in offering a very warm virtual uh, temple welcome to Jody Black, who we're so pleased could be with us here this afternoon. Jody, I'm turning it to you. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Oh, good. Well, you're not going to be able to see me. Apparently, the video is not working. All of the technical issues are entirely my fault. We can see um, you. So we we you can, can see, see you. Okay. Yeah, okay. we can. How about that? So, um, so I'm going to turn off my own picture just to avoid the distractions, and I'll welcome you into my room because I'm unable to use my background. But I want to thank you very much for um, inviting me to talk today during this very interesting uh, set of a. Uh, of a celebration of research and innovation talks. I was able to join um, for a few of the ones preceding me, and I think you've done just an outstanding job in contributing to the um, intervention development for this epidemic. So thank you very much for your hard work. Um, I wanted to spend a little while today just telling you about some of the strategies and programs that I developed to enable uh, innovation development in the context of the federal government going back about 10 years. So um, if we could go to the next slide, I don't think I'll be able to control the slides. I just need to tell you that um, the views and opinions expressed in all of my slides are entirely mine and not to attribute them to the FDA. Next slide, please. So um, I think we all agree that the research performing institutions of our country are definitely our innovation engines. All good things come out of those institutions and they're the basis, a lot of the basis for our econ economic development strategies and programs. But it is known that the process of translating those basic science discoveries to public health improvements is very important, but it's also a difficult objective in biomedical research. And for the past 10 years, I've been trying to understand how to improve what the barriers are and what the problems are. And what I learned a while ago was that 
a lot of the problems from the very beginning is a gap in funding to do the proof of concept work that's required for feasibility and validation studies. This, this work is not hypothesis driven um, and it's way too early and too risky to be of interest to any downstream kind of investor. And the federal government normally doesn't fund that. Um, there's also a lack of basic knowledge and understanding among academicians about how you bring a new technology, a new discovery to the market. It's unclear who else plays a role often in these activities, including the regulators, the, the legal people, the patent folks. Um, and so that lack of understanding one needed to be dealt with. There's also a lack of sufficient technology development and commercialization resources and infrastructure that are required for this very early stage technology development. This is where we want to put a lot of focus from the other um, agencies that have um, roles and responsibilities in helping to move products through the pipeline and into the market to make sure that mistakes, costly, time-consuming mistakes, aren't made at those very early stages when there is the least knowledge about what to do next. So um, about 10 years ago, if we can go to the next slide, please. Or let, let me just tell you that since I started working on this project, the federal government has been very interested in highlighting its interest in lab to market activities, understanding that this is an, an, a fabulous way for to, to support economic development. And if we go back just to the Obama administration, there was a presidential me and memorandum that was issued to all of the heads of agencies and, and departments to focus on accelerating technology transfers. You do it the next clip, please. Um, and then a couple years later, the Office of Science and Technology Policy hosted a workshop for all the federal agencies that I helped lead to talk about the lab to market activities they were working on. And we brought in a panel of outside experts to hear what we were planning and what some of our strategies were and to provide some input and to speak into some things that needed to be highlighted. And a, a very big theme from the outcome of this meeting was that there needed to be a consistent and reliable support of infrastructure and funding. Next click, please. Um, and then in our most recent administration, the, the president's management agenda included a cross-agency priority goal that directed the agencies to improve the transfer of federally funded technologies from the lab to the market. And next click. And the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which is part of the Department of Commerce, uh, put together what they called a green paper after talking to a lot of the agencies to try to understand what policies and processes were barriers and made suggestions about what, what could be changed there. But since the 1980s, if you could go to the next click, the early 80s, the federal government has supported a program called the Small Business Innovation Research and the Small Business Technology Transfer Research Program that directs federal agencies to use a portion of their um, funding budget to support small businesses, recognizing that small businesses are the beginning of the economic development process in the United States. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this program. It is congressionally mandated. The money can't be spent on anything else. And across all the federal agencies, um, there's $3.8 billion that are available for small companies and for academic institutions to collaborate with small companies to transition technologies out of the lab. All this funding is non-dilutive. The government doesn't ever get anything back from this. And this is the primary federal mechanism for, to help commercialize innovations. And there are several special provisions in this law that allow some of the federal agencies to use some of this funding to add an additional enabling features and, and facilitate commercialization activities. For example, at NIH, we brought in entrepreneurs and residents when I was there. Um, and just to let you know, the, the portion of the NIH uh, small business funding across the federal agencies is one is over $1.2 billion. So that's a lot of money. That's a significant source of funding to help develop early stage technologies. Um, and you can read more about this on the Small Business Administration's website. If you could go to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about um, what one of the provisions allowed the NIH to do, and that was to develop a proof of concept a pilot proof of concept partnership program, essentially develop proof of concept centers in an academic setting. So this allowed the NIH to use some of its STTR money to fund academic institutions instead of small companies. Normally, the small business money must only be used for small companies. Otherwise, it, it's illegal and it, it's only supposed to be spent there. But recognizing that there was some difficulty in transitioning and new innovations from the lab to the market, 
Um, there was a provision in the law that allowed NIH to experiment with developing proof of concept centers in the academic setting. And, and the law also laid out what we should do. There was sufficient funds in this, in this allowance to provide about $150,000 for the feasibility studies, but it also required that the innovators be exposed to the kinds of mentors and business, um, business developers and regulatory experts and investors and project managers who could help them understand what they needed to do to develop a technology to be commercially recognizable. So the goal was to scout promising technologies, bring them into these centers. And the NHLBI started this initiative first and called theirs the Centers for Accelerated Innovations. A couple of years later, uh, we scaled it to go across the entire NIH, calling it the Research Evaluation and Commercialization Hubs. But the goal was to scout the innovations, assign project management, put a team around these folks who could help them understand how to, do, how to continue to do their feasibility bench work, still at their bench, in a way that met business case requirements, regulatory requirements, understanding of what their intellectual property and freedom to operate was, and how to talk to investors. The whole goal, the, the, what the law wanted us to do, was help academia understand how to spin out robust companies that would be very poised to compete in the small business program. And the overall goal also is to improve uh, patient and societal benefit. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, I just wanted to share with you where we are with this program now. So starting in 2013, uh, three, three awards were made of three small consortia that are shown in the green here. We added on over two more funding uh, levels, two more funding opportunities to add an additional uh, set of, of of institutions that are in um, purple and red going across the country. So what we have now is a national network of proof of concept centers that all work together. They attend one program steering committee meeting. They share their best practices for understanding how to scout technologies, how to assess them for commercial potential, how to put project management around them, how to teach innovators to develop their work using um, milestones rather than specific aims, and to tranche that funding based on, miles, on getting through milestones rather than just continuing to provide, to provide funding. And it was okay to fail, and it was okay to fail fast. The, this initiative was also required to develop training activities and resources that could help innovators become um, trained at entrepreneurial activities without forcing them to become entrepreneurs. So we want our scientists to stay at their bench if that's what they want to do. But we also want them to understand what their role is in helping to transition the technology out into um, commercial potential. During this entire process, there was a lot of personalized feedback for the individual innovators from the NIH and from other federal partners that included the FDA, CMS, the Patent and Trademark Office, and a private payer, um, Kaiser, joined us. So this is where we were trying to, to teach the innovators and each other how we could help speak into preventing mistakes at the very earliest stages of development. And more recently, the National Institute for General Medical Sciences has developed a similar initiative focused on idea states. Those are states that don't receive um, very much NIH funding, recognizing the fact that not all the great ideas are on each coast. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, just to give you some outcomes, uh, th this, ex this, this was a big experiment and continues to evolve and develop. It's, it, was a, it was a case of um, you know, building the plane and flying it at the same time. It's a very agile network. They figure out what works, they share it with each other, and they change things as needed. But so far, there have been 334 projects funded. But more importantly, even if you don't receive the funding to develop your innovation, you do receive entrepreneurial training. So about 3,000 in academic innovators have been trained. There have been $819 million in follow-on funding. We see that as a good indicator because the entire federal investment here was about $43 million. Um, what I forgot to tell you earlier was we set this program up to be a matching program. And we did that for a couple of reasons. We wanted the, the um, awardees to understand how to leverage their local ecosystem. That was actually a requirement of the initiative. Leverage the local ecosystem, not just for additional funding, but for additional intellectual capital, because we wanted the, the, the system to be set up and to be sustainable when the federal funding ended. So when it became normal to look for innovations, create partners, understand how to attract additional funding for them, and to help develop these technologies using local ecosystem resources, um, then the federal government could let the, let the um, institution you know, take over. 
So that was the intention was to build a sustainable set of infrastructure that could keep this going as a normalized process, just as normal as publishing a paper. So in addition to the follow on funding, it, the, it, the, um, the awardees are spinning out companies. They do compete very well for the small business program. Their success rate is a little over, is about 50%, a little over actually, which is more than twice what the normal success rate is in, under most circumstances for the small business program. So this experiment for setting up proof of concept centers in an academic setting to normalize this kind of work looks like it's working. So if we can uh, go to the next slide, please. And so these centers, the, this, this network was ready when the pandemic hit. Um, and it was able to be leveraged to help develop diagnostic assays to detect COVID-19. There's, um, there's another proof of concept center called the, the Point of Care Translational Research Network, which is managed by the National Institute for Biomedical Im Imaging and Bioengineering. And when NIH received a bolus of funds for, to develop diagnostics, that network was leveraged for that purpose. And it was able to incorporate in, um, organizations, both academic and businesses, who were either ready or could pivot into developing technologies for detection of COVID-19. The more mature technologies went in through that network. I'm sure most of you have read about it. Those that weren't quite ready to go into this network, they weren't quite mature enough, were able to leverage the resources of the proof of concept centers, the centers and the REACH program to continue developing technologies that looked promising. That was their sweet spot, the very early, early technologies where they were still assessing whether or not they could be, um, they would have a potential to, to um, fulfill this goal. So an additional 25 projects through the RADx program were able to be diverted to the existing uh, other, other networks and some of them are working on pre-EUA submissions, and there have been some follow-on investments. So I think the investment that the country, that the NIH, using its federal partners, has put into these proof of concept center networks has been well worth it. If we could go to the next slide, please. So I, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of historical perspective on how the FDA has been collaborating with the NIH. I don't, I'm not sure that, mo that many people are aware of this, but back even when I was at the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and I created the Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination to experiment with developing these um, commercialization-enabling programs, we brought in the kinds of experts that, at the time, NIH didn't normally hire, like business development experts and regulatory experts. And so our regulatory expert developed a series of um, videos called the NIH Small Business Hangout, and one of them was focused on how do you talk to the FDA? We all understand that the FDA is a, a little, um, um, it, it can be you know, a, a, a little awesome to try and uh, navigate through. The FDA recognizes that and is working very hard to try to make it easier to communicate. But back even in 2014, we were working very closely with them to try to explain what steps needed to be taken under certain product development um, processes. And we, all, we tried things like providing supplemental funds to companies that were building, that were working in the device arena to come and visit the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, to talk to them pre-pre, like a pre-pre meeting, to talk to them about how they should be thinking about their early stage development so that they would meet regulatory requirements. And that office has, if you can click again, when I left the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and went to the office of the director to scale those activities to focus not just on the NHLBI mission, but on the entire NIH mission, um, and all the extra enabling features like entrepreneurs and residents, access to business development expertise it's, and regulatory expertise. Some of my colleagues joined me in the new office uh, that's in the office of the director now called the Small Business Education and Entrepreneurial Development Office. That office is a little over two years old, but they are working on developing the same kind of regulatory guides that are going to be available not just to the public, but also to the NIH program officials who are learning how to better manage programs that have product development outcomes, not just um, publication outcomes, which are equally as important. They're both important. So I just wanted to alert you to this office and to and suggest that you stay tuned. And if you Google it, you'll be able to find it very easily. Um, and so now if we can uh, go into the next slide, I just want to give you a brief overview of what the FDA does. Um, when I was where you are, when I was growing up in academia, I didn't pay any attention to the FDA. I knew it existed, but I really didn't pay any attention to it. But it has, it's part of the Department of Health and Human Services, and its mission is to advance public health, advance and protect public health, and also to help speed product innovations 
for societal benefit. It is working very hard on adjusting its strategies um, to make sure that things move through as quickly as possible. The FDA regulates products. The FDA regulated products account for about 20, 20 cents of every U.S. dollar. And the FDA also supports intramural research and, and extramural research through um, um, contract and grant announcements. Um, it's a very, very tiny program compared to NIH. It's, it's pencil dust, but it, it does, it's very focused on looking for help in developing tools, standards, approaches, and clinical, tr clinical trial strategies that can be used to assess safety and efficacy that will help them in their review, help improve their reviews. And so um, the BAAs, uh, you can, there's, there's links to both uh, how to find information for both uh, BAAs and grants. Actually, the grants are announced, the, the grant um, solicitations are announced through the NIH guide for grants and contracts. The FDA also hosts meetings to support and educate uh, industry and small businesses on how to understand and navigate regulatory requirements and processes. And those meetings are also relevant to folks in the academic setting. And there's also a very large patient engagement set of activities. And the three main uh, medical product centers are the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, Center for Biologics and Evaluation Research, and the Center for Drugs Evaluation and Research. Um, and the next slide uh, provides just a brief overview of what the FDA regulates. So the FDA regulates foods. There's another center that regulates foods, everything from bottled water to infant formula. There's the drug, the Center for Drugs, I think is obvious. The Center for Biologics right now is working very hard in overtime on vaccines. It also regulates blood products. Um, the Center for Devices regulates everything from tongue depressors to pacemakers. The FDA also regulates um, products that give off radiation, like the microwave oven in your kitchen, in addition to cosmetics, veterinary products, and tobacco products. And so um, I'm, I'm going to stop there to see if anyone has any questions. I hope I gave you an overview of the kinds of collaborative activities that are happening within the federal government to enhance and enable the transition of the lab to the market, recognizing that the FDA, the NIH, and CMS all have a role to play here in bringing their, their strategies and requirements together and helping innovators understand what those are early on so they can be moving towards those targets. So thank you. Dr. Black, this is uh, David Sarwer from the College of Public Health. I was moderating the, the question and answer session right before you started, and I'm gonna moderate yours as well. Um, while, while we're populating and getting some questions coming in, I have a, a question for you as somebody who's been both at NHLBI and now at FDA. Um, how, how do you view maybe for, um, particularly our early and mid-career uh, attendees today, how do you view the value of service to an, ex an FDA advisory panel in terms of um, career development for young professionals? So I, I've had the good fortune of uh, doing some consulting work with some of the device companies. So I've been at some FDA meetings, um, but I've always been struck by how much everybody learns going through that experience. So can you comment a little bit from your perspective on, on the value of, of pursuing those opportunities for junior and mid-career folks? I think if those opportunities become valuable, it's, it's extraordinarily valuable. I'm going to use NIH as an example, but many years ago, the NIH recognized the value of including earlier stage investigators, you know, junior and mid-career in their peer review panels because it brings in different thinking and it helps them understand how to, how to develop you know, better quality grants. Um, and there's lots of opportunities now that for, at the FDA to bring in the patient perspective because the FDA learns. So it's not only valuable for the individual to participate and learn, but the individual brings other ideas and considerations to the table that helps the FDA learn. So I think it's really a, a two-way street. It's, it, if, it's, if the opportunity presents itself, and you have the time, I would suggest taking advantage of it. Yeah, I, I, I'm thrilled. I anticipated you were gonna say that. I'm thrilled that you did though. Um, I'm actually trained as a psychologist and do a lot with patient reported outcome measures um, in addition to the work I do in obesity. And I was very pleased years ago when the FDA really put a priority on um, sponsors and making sure that they were bringing the most robust science to patient reported outcome measures, two issues of patient satisfaction, benefits, and, and, and that companies couldn't just say that treatment X 
uh, improves quality of life without in fact having the evidence to suggest that they do. So um, I'm, I'm thrilled that the FDA moved in that direction and, and continues to stay on course there. Um, one of the yeah. questions that has come in from the audience is, can you give us a little bit of an overview of the process for full approval from an emergency approval for something like a vaccine for COVID? Um, I wish I could. So I joined the FDA about five months ago for the purpose of getting more involved in what the review processes are like. So I don't have all those, um, I don't have all the nuances that are required to move from EUA to full approval. But, um, but there's probably information about that on the FDA website that I could try to, to find out. Um, most of it is going to require, I believe, um, understanding what the follow-up measures are telling, uh, telling the reviewers, telling the, the mm -hmm. staff internally. Okay. And, and while I'm waiting perhaps for another question or two to come in, given the, the relatively newness of your tenure, it must be an interesting time to have made that switch given all that's going on <laughs> with regards yes. to, uh, to healthcare and, and dealing with the pandemic. What, what has surprised you the most about working at the FDA as opposed to being over at NIH? Um, the FDA is a very cohesive, dedicated group of people. Not that the NIH folks aren't there equally as dedicated and cohesive, but um, I've joined this environment in a completely virtual mode. I have only met two of the people that report to me, but everybody has just stepped up to the plate. Uh, they work very well together. It's a very uh, smooth running, very dedicated agency. I'm not sure people appreciate that in order to make all of these approvals, all of these EUAs, all of these vaccines available, many people didn't sleep for many nights in a row. The reviewers are truly amazing people, very dedicated, very smart, um, and really have the best interest of the public at heart. And I'm, I'm not sure that's fully appreciated. Yeah, I, I, I would also agree, again, just seeing it a little bit from the external consultant side, the amount of work that goes in is staggering. Um, mm -hmm. But I have always found it to be such a fascinating process where you, I think you learn a, a lot about yourself and your own areas of expertise, but you also learn a great deal about complementary areas of expertise that often surround you. Um, and, and I do think whether it be for, you know, regardless of your station in your career, it, it really is a phenomenal opportunity. And I also think it, it does remind you that you are providing a service to you know the the American healthcare infrastructure in some ways and and that that's really kind of an honor and a privilege if you think about it um, I, I do have a couple of questions that are pending for our panelists and we are going to extend the session to about 140 for those of you who can continue to stay with us um, another question uh, related to gene therapy so Glenn this may go to you um, in gene therapy and immuno-oncology treatments, it's common practice to treat patients with immunosuppressants, um, while infusions of the drugs to suppress CRS or cytokine release syndrome. Are any similar studies being done with vector-based COVID-19 vaccines, such as J&J &J and AstraZeneca? And this also may be appropriate for Dr. Kreiner as well. I, I will definitely defer to either Jerry or Nina, because I think they're <laughs> Probably more involved in, in that area. Nina, do you want to take a stab at it? Um, I uh, I'm not um, I'm not sure if I uh, could venture um, a thoughtful answer to the relationship. So uh, I guess your question is to is um, using the using the the uh, strategies in gene therapy to. Mm -hmm augment um, the um, uh, the adenoviral vector, is that what you mean? Um, so that it can avoid some of the issues with um, some of the potential complications of, that, I believe that's of those vectors. Um, I, so I, I think once um, it starts to become better understood as to what the issue, what the immune, um, the, um, the changes to the immune response are, um, uh, you know, uh, particularly, uh, I think the one that comes to mind is uh, is is the um, uh, the change to the um, the antibody response to the platelet factor that um, has now been recognized as a uh, uh, as um, 
uh, as what might be causing the um, uh, the cases of that TTP like um, condition in um, after um, adenoviral um, adenoviral vector uh, vaccines. Um, once that's understood, uh, then perhaps the gene therapy can be um, can be used to target that. Is what I would uh, what I would imagine. I don't know if we can. Um, if uh, I don't, uh, I don't know if I understand um, the the um, uh, the therapies well enough to um, see if it can be any broader than that. I think it still would have to target um, something that's um, some observation. Yeah. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna throw a question out to all of you um, and ask you to pull out your crystal balls because you know as evidence-based practitioners we always love to do that. Um, assuming that the surge, the, the little surge that we're in now um, remits and that we optimistically come out of the summer and enter into the fall with a relatively low case rate um, that, you know, we've, we've obviously learned a great deal as we've heard about today from how to treat and manage patients, you know, the evidence among people who are vaccinated but who still contract the virus uh, is still very encouraging in terms of death rates and severity of illness. Where do you think that will leave us at the end of 2021 and early 2022? Um, will we be looking at needing to provide booster vaccines for people who are receiving them this spring? Um, are we potentially looking at another round or another surge on the heels of the routine cold and flu season? What, what do we think yet to come in the next nine to 12 months? I'd, I'd be interested in what Sergey thinks about what potential future uh, variants may be coming or because as Sergey mm -hmm. Sergey described, there's a whole lot of variants out there, right? But we don't know which one may emerge in, in the population. Oh, uh, I mean, sure, uh, to give you a one minute overview when um, SARS-CoV-2 got into the human population for the first nine months uh, from January 2020 to about October of 2020, uh, it was not doing very much in terms of evolution. It was accumulating mutations, uh, but they were not changing uh, what the virus was doing in terms of infectivity, in terms of uh, transmissibility. Um, and then uh, in November and December, um, there were basically three independent introductions of what are now known as the N501 lineages or variants of concern. Um, and you know, our best hypothesis is that what happened is that enough people um, had developed some sort of partial uh, immunity uh, against the virus. So now it has to work harder to infect humans. And uh, that's unlikely to change, um, right? Um, coronaviruses have been with us for tens, probably hundreds of millions of years. Uh, they're highly adapted at cross-species transmission. And, you know, as you know from the common cold, uh, which is also uh, sometimes caused by coronavirus, it's just, you know, sort of seasonal things. So there's a lot of um, speculation. It is difficult to draw lessons from previous um, epidemics um, like seasonal influenza because uh, our response uh, to this pandemic has been so drastically different. So really it's not com comparable. We never had you know, comparable uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, travel restrictions, uh, you know, vaccination programs. Um, but my guess, uh, you know, going forward is that, uh, we'll, yes, we will need regular vaccine updates. I mean, it's already happening. There is uh, uh, work to incorporate known mutations of concern, and we will continue surveilling the genomic diversity to try to identify what else, you know, might be put in. Uh, I mean, that's something that people have been doing with influenza vaccines for decades. Uh, with varying degrees of success. Uh, I think because we have such a uh, dramatic scale up of sequencing, we'll be doing better uh, for coronavirus than we did for influenza. Um, and then as far as whether or not, you know, what, what the seasonal dynamics are going to be, um, it, it's hard to predict. I mean, people uh, have different um, uh, expectations, uh, but, you know, there's no reason to believe uh, uh, that, you know, uh, that this, um, uh, respiratory RNA virus is going to do things dramatically different from what other respiratory RNA viruses are doing, which is it's going to continue to sort of, you know, try to escape our best efforts. Uh, but we do have new technologies. We 
do have um, you know, some international resolve to deal with this. So hopefully the outcome will be different uh, for this one. Servio, what do you think? What do you, what do you see in the next six to nine months? Um, you know, <laughs> there's always that, uh, that internal conflict between your personal views and, and whether you're an optimist or a realist or whatever versus, you know, professionally what you should say. <laughs> um, you know, I agree with everything that uh, Sergey just mentioned. Uh, you know, this virus is new to this human host. Um, it's going to do whatever it's going to do to try to survive within this host. And so my sort of crystal ball view right now is that I, I do think that variants are going to continue to be a, a huge concern, um, especially in a place like Brazil, where you have this new variant that is affecting younger people. Um, you know, new forms are certainly going to come about. And from a pathogenic standpoint, what what features will they have? Especially for me, uh, for, for a neuroscientist like me, I, I think that um, a virus that may become more neuroinvasive is certainly something that concerns me. Um, I, I think that the vaccine platforms, the, you know, there's still a lot of, you know, there's still a lot of unknowns there, right? You know, you have these uh, mRNA vaccines that are very exciting in terms of how well they boost immunity, but there's other stuff in it too, right? You know, pegylation and the derivatives of peg that over time we're going to build uh, immunity to. So how effective will those mRNA vaccines uh, be as we get boosters as, uh, as different formulations are created? Um, and the same goes for antiviral or viral vector-based vaccines. Um, as you know, as we see the viral vector from the standpoint of the immune system, um, our bodies are going to learn to neutralize that. So, uh, so that that's sort of the concerns that I have uh, as we move forward. And um, I, I like to say that I have a. Um, a more optimistic outlook, but I, I do feel that there's, because of the number of unknowns, um, I, I think that there is, uh, there is, there is numerous concerns that a, a scientific community needs to be thinking about and, and how do we step up to help? And that's essentially mm -hmm. how my lab got into the business of looking at SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is the time for us to contribute. So mm -hmm. hopefully that answers some, some of that. <laughs> Thanks, Sergio. Nina, what about from your perspective? Um, I think there, so there has been, um, uh, at least with the variants that had been, uh, that had, were recognized early on, there, there, um, there has been some data um, uh, as to whether the uh, current vaccines um, are, um, are effective against them. And that's, uh, and, and uh, th those are the ones that um, were being tested during that November, December time period when, um, yeah, and uh, specific to the J and J vaccine, uh, ninety-five percent of the people who were um, uh, who were um, uh, participated in the trial in South Africa actually had the variant. So, mm -hmm. um, and in that case, there was uh, you know, some you know, that the efficacy is not it's not huge. It's, it was only in the fifties and sixty percent um, range, and that may be um, uh, and that and, so, and that may be what uh, what how effective that vaccine will be for other variants as well. It's mm -hmm. um, that, that, I think that's what, um, that's certainly the, uh, the takeaway from, um, from those data. Um, the, uh, I, I know um, uh, the, uh, the changes, um, the, um, there have been some um, small reports of um, efficacy of the Moderna vaccine, I think, I'm not sure if it was Moderna or, or the Pfizer vaccine, against some of the known variant um, strains of, like of individuals that were um, that were found to have a variant as opposed as opposed to the original um, COVID disease, and they um, and that the, the efficacy was actually was reduced um, in the, with those vaccines as well um, in the 70s, 80 percent. So I think we're going to have a challenge um, again, no matter how we cut it. Um, if uh, but it remains to be seen just how because as as everyone's been saying, and I'm, I'm learning as it goes along that. These variants will are just that they are. They will yeah. continue to to, to morph um, over time, and uh, we're going to have to respond to it. And I think that's such an important point because it does seem, even from my perspective, that this is a situation where all of us are still learning as we go through this process. 
So Glenn, I'll give you the last word on this topic before I turn things over to Michelle, but I specifically want to know how much longer you think your new lab is going to be in the testing business? <laughs> well, I think as was just described, uh, every time uh, like Sergey finds some new change in the base, I'm like, okay, I've got to design new primers. I've got to get a new test because every <laughs> variant, I have to make sure that the testing is, is not disrupted. And in fact, the UK variant was initially identified because the Thermo Fisher had three genes. The S gene failed every time that because of the, the deletion that occurs in that variant, it messes up the assay. So that's my world is all these variants are gonna impact testing. Cause I think we're, we're still gonna be testing probably through 2022 and beyond, we'll see. Hmm. Great. Well, with that, Michelle, let me hand things back over to you to bring us home. All right, thank you so much, David. And thank you to all of the panelists. I really appreciate your time um, in putting together your comments and uh, rolling with our technical changes to the program. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. I hope all of you in the audience agree with me that uh, I think the university community will be hungry to hear much more. And given that we know that COVID is going to be with us for a time to come, we will definitely be re uh, reaching back out to the community to continue the conversation. Dr. Black had to drop off. She was able to give us a fair amount of time today and we're very grateful for that as well. I hope you found her talk as interesting as I did so that we can better understand um, the world of FDA and know that she is someone very keenly interested in the Temple story and the Temple uh, program of research. So I'm really pleased to be able to connect us all together in this forum. I wanna thank everyone again for joining us for this virtual research celebration. I uh, really appreciate the attention of the audience and all of your participation. And with that, I call our week to conclusion. We will see you soon again. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much.